Would you mind sharing a little bit about what your own home life was like as a child that led you to this work? Yeah, my, my home life was extremely chaotic. Um, to date, there are nine marriages between my parents. So there was a lot of change. Um, both of my parents are very toxic um, in their own unique ways, but both were very, very unpredictable, emotionally unavailable, unstable, um, selfish, and just really hard for me to figure out how to just daily function in life. You know, the first things my small feet were set upon in the morning were eggshells. So it just felt like there was always some sort of a test around every corner that I was supposed to pass, but I wasn't allowed to know topic or allowed to study for that test. And so I was always failing. And then I had a sibling who was treated much differently than myself. Um, and so I got to see someone else get their needs met uh, in a very enabled and meshed way. And I was getting none of my needs met and I was being yelled at, cast out um, and treated very poorly for my entire childhood. So then you add, you know, nine marriages between the two of them. And I was just lost. I was lost and I was scapegoated and I kept trying to tell the truth and, and to speak up and that just didn't serve me. Yeah, I heard you in an interview use the word sadistic to describe your mom, which is such a heavy word for someone to have to use about their parent. Could you share kind of where that word comes from for you, what your experiences were like that kind of fit under this label? And then what do you wish someone had told you then, uh, especially before you had the ability to kind of leave home and be on your own? My mom isn't isn't just mean. Um, she's calculated and was intentional in setting me up to hurt me and bait me and get me to give her the negative reaction to her abuse that she wanted. And I didn't know I was being manipulated. I didn't know I was being set up. So I was falling in the same hole all the time getting more and more angry at myself and more and more angry at her. She, she hated me. So it isn't that she just neglected me. Um, she, she hated me. And then at the same time, I'd have to be her therapist, her best friend, her confidant, um, all the while hating me at the same time. And there was, it's just sadistic. I mean, I, I can't imagine calculatingly treating someone, anyone, the way that she has treated me, let alone that she was my mom and quite charming socially. Um, so no one would really believe me. I mean, just a mean woman. And I think she hates women in general. Um, my sibling is a is a boy, so I don't think he took some of that. I know um, some of the women in his life have, but she's just really mean. And um, there just isn't another word for her other than sadistic. And I, I wish when I was young that anyone would have just given me a small slice of validation, like, yes, that was really mean. When people would see her be mean, they would then say, you know, she didn't mean it that way. Um, she's your mom. You know, surely she loves you, right? And what child doesn't want to believe that their mother loves them? And she was very much Mother Gothel, just mean. Do you have any experience that stands out when you speak about that uh, for, for anybody who kind of struggles to understand that? When did you realize uh, that she hated you? Not really until I had my own child and I had moved away. I got my body out of that toxicity. I moved to another state. And through my PhD, you know, I started studying books on my own about self-absorbed parents, toxic parents, immature parents, passive aggressive personality disorder. Um, and they were all fitting. 
but I still had hope because I just wanted a mom. And, you know, abuse doesn't work without doses of intermittent kindness. And so she would give me those just as I was done. But she truly wanted to make my life as hard on me as possible. Um, me becoming more and more successful, I was hoping would earn me into her heart because it did with my sibling, but me becoming as a woman more and more successful just made her hate me more. And um, it was just such a painful existence. And for people that have moms like mine, I have a waiting list out my door in my practice. It is so surreal that a mother could hate her daughter the way that toxic mothers hate their daughters that there, there's truly just no word in any literature that can quite describe the shock of that and, and the process of what it's like to accept that as a daughter is, is really challenging and it does require a lot of self-examination and work and courage to step out of that relationship and understand that you don't owe her anything. Yeah, you said something super powerful there. Uh, abuse doesn't work with some doses of kindness. I'm sure that just hit a lot of people. Can you speak a little on that and what you mean by that? Of course. If if it's all abuse, it's like negative reinforcement, right? It's If it's never going to be good, you, you tend to just recognize that it's time to go. But when when the goodness is is kind of dolloped in there, it, it doses you up on hope. And hope becomes dope. Do you know what I'm saying? You, you sort of get addicted to the hope in your parent. And that now they get it. They're nice. Now they're gonna see me. They're gonna they're gonna love me. We're gonna be able to have this connection. We're gonna be able to, you know, have a new start. And that's what every hope looks like. And then the hope becomes relentless hope uh, because hope is probably the most innocent and magical of the emotions in a child. I mean, Disneyland is completely built on hope, right? To toy with hope in a child just to know it's a game and to do it for sport just to keep them hooked is just cruel. Um, in my new book, Adult Survivors of Emotionally Abusive Parents, I talk about the difference between relentless hope and rebellious hope. Um, relentless hope will lead the child to hate because each time that you're given a dose of kindness and they've got you hooked, it's like, then they're comfortable. They start devaluing you. Then they discard you again. And then they kind of suck you back in and the hope each time becomes greater as does the loss to your self-worth becomes greater each time you fall down this spectrum. And I had to learn that relentless hope would lead me to hate. I would hate her. And when I would hate her and I would show it, she was so satisfied because she got me to be ugly. And that's what she wanted. So she wouldn't have to own the hostility that was in her heart. She could project it all over me and my natural healthy reaction to being abused. Then she called me the abuser. And I was too young to understand that my anger was justified. Um, I think that hate just brings a child's hope to some closure. It sort of says enough is enough. It's a very honest hate. It's not a revengeful hate. It's I've had enough. I hate you. Go away. Leave me alone. Um, and then after she could grab my hatred for her, and provoke it and create it in me, then she'd be as nice to me as she could be. Then I'd have relentless hope again, but now I'm bringing shame along with me because I was mean to my mom. So I had to get out of that cycle of hope to hate and I needed to find a rebellious hope in myself that I could do this life alone and without a mother. And I did. And does that apply to romantic relationships as well, this this abuse and kindness and back to abuse? Yes, it's the cycle of violence. When is a domestic violent person the nicest to their partner is after they hit them, right? So 
my father was physically violent and he was always nice to me after he was violent. I preferred the violence to uh, the degrading, uh, cursing me out, calling me horrible names. And my physical wound has healed far more quickly and effortlessly than the fact that he would ever hit me in the first place. You know, it's all abuse is emotional. If we're molested, it hurts. It hurts our heart. It hurts our soul. It hurts our truth. It hurts our dignity. If we're hit by a parent, it hurts our heart. It hurts our worth. It hurts our dignity. If we are cursed at, verbally abused, and or pass aggressively abused with sarcasm and cut downs, it hurts our heart. It hurts our spirit and it hurts our truth. It hurts our authenticity. It robs us from being identified as a good person. All abuse is emotional. So it's, it's a journey that you go through that the doses of kindness are so powerful because we need them so bad. And the parent knows this. The domestic violent partner knows this. They know what they're doing. People who say they don't know what they're doing have been fooled. This is who and how they want to be. And that is a truth society has a hard time hanging their hat on. It's irrelevant if there's good in all people when so many people die toxic. Yeah, you mentioned your father there, which is actually something I wanted to ask you about because you said something very similar to what you just said. You said, that when my father hit me, it was easier than when he'd call me a loser which uh, speaks to this idea that we love talking about in our community about how insidious little T trauma, not that calling you a, a child a loser is little, but what are your thoughts on why it's harder for people who may have had more kind of hidden-ish uh, forms of abuse and neglect to process? Because it's not obvious. I can't prove a tone of voice. I cannot prove the look of disgust on my mother's face anytime I walked into a room. Ugh, she's here. I mean, that's what I got. I can't prove that. And then if I said anything, who's going to believe me? Parents are inherently believed over their children. Look at uh, law and crime. What, what kind of a witness is a child? They would believe a parent over a child, right? So it's hard because you just cannot prove it. And then if you cannot prove it, you have no voice, no one will believe you. And it's been proven also that little doses of emotional abuse over long periods of time is far more traumatic on the human psyche than a major traumatic event. Because if there's a major traumatic event, like a, a hurricane or something like as horrific as a 9-11. If you know you're loved, if you know you're loved, you have a reason to live and you have a support to go to when that traumatic event is over. But if you are not loved and you do not have that foundation, you will not make it through a traumatic event like that. I don't know if you know the story of Elizabeth Smart, but she was kidnapped out of her home in Utah and taken for nine months. And then she was found. And I read her story and what kept her alive and surviving the horrific abuses from rape to torture to starvation that she was going through was that she knew she had a family that loved her and she was living for them. I wouldn't have lived through what she did. I wouldn't have. I would have had what reason to live through that, right? That's how important this stuff is. I coin a term in my book, Adult Survivors of Toxic Family Members, because it's not in the literature. And I'm finding that a lot of things that I experience that my personality has done to protect itself is not in the literature. So, I coined a term called foundational anxiety. People like me live every day somewhere in their mind a little bit 
Like when is the bottom going to fall out? When is the bottom going to, the bottom's going to fall out? If, if my life gets too good, something is going to take it away. And this is the power that toxic parents have on their children is to have no trust in the very foundation and stability of their life. You're a huge proponent of going no contact when the situation calls for it. Mm -hmm. Most therapists, most therapists don't even mention it, let alone encourage it. And even just here in our content, I see so much aggressiveness against it. Why is it such an important issue for you? And what do you think of the very loud opposition to it? Oh, that opposition just loves me. <laughs> uh, I deal with it every day. I, I'm a disruptor. Um, and I think disruptors are important. Are my books going to be bestsellers? Probably not. But I believe in an adherence to truth and authenticity. And I believe it's my right to choose authenticity over attachment. And that is so much scarier to choose authenticity over attachment. Hands down, people will choose attachment over authenticity because the family is supposed to be a solid foundation for you and an umbrella of protection for you all throughout life. And the sad thing is, is that our society holds strangers to higher standards of treatment of children. If, if my parents had been strangers and people saw the way I was treated, they would be in jail. My father especially would be in jail, okay? Um, CPS was called on my parents when I was two for neglect. They didn't take the, the, um, the call, right? They didn't take the report, but my father broke one of his students' arms as a teacher and lost his job, but he can hit me and doesn't lose his title. How is that right? I don't encourage no contact. I support it. I have never, ever, ever encouraged anyone to go no contact because the people who go no contact, they don't want anyone to know because they don't want to deal with this societal backlash, right? We are not in a society where we're allowed to talk about the problematic character of bad parents in a culturally open and safe space. But I am not a piece of property that this these parents own. They don't own me. I should not owe them for the rest of my life. I believe that parents should be obligated to their children, that children should not be obligated to their parents. The child didn't choose to come here. The child is not responsible enough to be obligated to the parent. The parent made the responsible choice to have a children and part of that responsibility is to be obligated and committed to those children. Not to discard them when the child isn't being a proper source of image or a proper source of attention, right? So if you've gone no contact, you've tried everything. <laughs> I stayed abused for four and a half decades. This isn't cancel culture. This isn't, there's a spat and an argument, and then we're not going to talk anymore. That's what happened to me growing up. If I wasn't in alignment with whatever was going on, I would be cut off from my mother and cut off from my father. And then they would make me mend the fence. And that is how my life was. So human beings, thank God, are blessed with a tolerance level that will run out and mine ran out and I think toxic parents because they believe they own something and then if they own something they can treat it however they want because they cannot lose it is a very naive belief in a narcissistic parent because if you have a strong-willed child that you scapegoat and you abuse and you harm there's a bandwidth that that person will run out of um I didn't end the relationship with my parents. They cut me off. And I was at a point like, wow, I mean, if I'm getting cut off for the smallest infractions, then this is going to be forever. Most people don't cut off until midlife. This is what, what people don't understand. It's not just 
running around just chopping limbs off, right? Um, no one in their right mind would ever want to be without their parents. So sometimes people will assume I haven't thought things through and, and that is insane to me. I found and thought of every way to stay. <laughs> I wasn't ever planning to leave. I left because I was thrown out like a piece of trash and I just haven't mended the fence and I've chosen to turn my perpetrators into a purpose, right? That's my right. And I make people like me know that they're not alone, that there is something out there more sadistic than an emotionally immature parent. There are sadistic, mean, cruel parents who should never have had children and do not deserve to hold those children hostage in an emotional prison for the remainder of their lives. And I think at midlife, we stop thinking from like birth to life we start thinking life to death. And I think the meaning of life comes into a different space and we don't wanna live a meaningless abused life. So we have to save our own. And no contact does that, nor is no contact about hate or revenge or bitterness. You know, to be honest with you, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to articulate this well, but. I never had contact. I tried so hard to find connection and contact with these people. So I never made contact. There was never contact. It's just that now I'm not trying anymore. I'm accepting the fact that there's never gonna be contact unless I willingly submit to being abused and manipulated my entire life. And I don't wanna to submit to that anymore because I've tried everything. I've asked questions and thought things through in ways that people could never even imagine to stay. So I'm very clear that the decision that I've made has saved my life. I feel like in midlife, I got a rebirth and um, it's been challenging, but I love the feeling that now this life is dictated by me and that I can be a happy, elegant, smart, loving human being to other people like me, whose, whose life doesn't fit in to the more gentle, um, safe, um, you know, flawed, emotionally immature parent. There are people out there like me that there's no safety. So I'm here for those people. Kristen Cavallari, who we love, uh, yes. shared a clip on Instagram where in her discussion with you, she was mentioning an ex. And that ex, she said, exhibited signs of narcissism. And when I went into the comments of that clip, they were just full of enraged comments about how dare you talk about an ex publicly. Your kids will see this. You do social media. So you're the actual narcissist, right? Just like full rage. Yeah. And I was wondering, is that part of being a public figure or is that energy common, a common sentiment for people coming out of narcissistic relationships? Um, I think it's both. Um, I feel very protective of Kristen Cavallari. Um, I think she's so authentic and, and I think she adheres to truth and I think our children deserve to hear the truth. Um, in, in my, when I watch people just rage on her, it, it, it just is like, this is just insane. One human being who's doing a show, that show helped so many people. I had so much reset, reach out from that show when she discussed her ex-husband. And, you know, so many of my clients are trying to divorce people like this, right? And she has every right to tell her story. And I think that her children are already living in that environment and they already know the truth if they're living in it. My daughter certainly did. I didn't have to explain the truth of who her father was. She knew. So when she would ask me questions about her dad or make statements about her dad, I would tell her, you are right. That is how he is. And that is not gonna change. So we have to figure out how to navigate around those things until you are 14, right? So now I will also say that there is a group of parents online, they've labeled themselves rejected parents and they've started estrangement groups. 
and they have come on to my social media and called me a cult leader. They've claimed that I have all this criminal stuff and I did a Google cleanup. I mean, it is hilarious. At some point, it's hilarious. Um, when a narcissist gets exposed, they get loud. So anyone who's raging on Kristen really needs to take a look in the mirror on why is she so triggering for you, <laughs> right? Um, is it because she's just beautiful and successful and um, loving and a great mother and, you know, she got a divorce and she's doing the best she can? Uh, I, I think she is. Um, her ex-husband can go on and tell his story if that's what he wants to do. He's not that type of public figure. She is. She's using her voice and I think she's helping far more than her haters. Um, but these people are emotionally violent and I had to really learn to develop thick skin. I almost stopped social media at one point because I'm like, I already lived through this. I lived through this bullshit every day growing up. Like I don't want to keep living it again through someone else's mother. You know, I had a woman say, my 20 year old just cut me off. It's your fault. Um, you're destroying the American family, blah, blah, blah. And I just block, remove, and delete. But wow, I don't know your daughter. She's never been in my office. <laughs> I don't know you. You've never been in my office. But if your daughter found my book, I promise you, with never knowing her, I'm not the cause and source of her looking for that book. And the fact that she would come on on my page and rage like that, thank God that 20 year old took care of herself and cut that woman off. If she's so willing to go on social media and rage where her daughter could see that now she's attacking experts that she reads to help herself, right? So I, I, t I'm, I have learned to have a very thick skin to that. Um, I did do a TEDx talk and what I can say is for the most part, I, I, I do feel very loved in social media. Um, I, I have my haters. I don't give them a lick of attention. I just block, remove, and delete, or I don't respond at all, right? I'm not gonna give that stuff my attention. That's something I learned growing up, that if, if I reacted, I was bad. If I cried about my abuse, I was pathetic. So somewhere in my teenage years, I just became vapor. I just got out of my body and I just found a way to disappear so that it, it didn't affect me. You know, I mean, I didn't have any other choice at some point. Um, so when people attack other people, it's, it's interesting to me and somewhat laughable that they can't step back from their own attack of someone and be like, I mean, where's really the abuser? It's strange that there's such a profound lack of self-awareness in these uh, people online that do stuff like this. Yeah, you touched on that there. Can you explain the idea of gray rocking when yeah. dealing with narcissists? And can we use that with our narcissistic parents as well? I think that you can, depending on the level of narcissism. If they're just emotionally immature parents, I think gray rocking is fantastic, right? Um, I think when someone's emotionally immature, um, maybe their intent isn't to abuse you. They're not calculating their abuse. They're just very self unaware um, and self-centered, right? Which isn't fun, but there is a way that I teach my clients that there's like low contact, cordial contact or high contact. And gray rocking is really just accepting them that they're immature, accepting that it's gonna be kind of about them, that they're probably gonna say things that are gonna irritate you, but you just learn not to bite and not to engage, right? You just gray rock them like, haha. you just kind of go along with it because you know they're just emotionally unintelligent, right? You know it's not personal. So I think that gray rocking is fantastic there. I can say from experience with a sadistic parent that it does not work with them. It will work with them for a second because they do like being the center of attention and gray rocking is really about just deflecting the conversation always back onto the toxic person. But sadistic parents can't feel themselves as alive unless they're destroying someone else and getting the satisfaction of that person's pain or hatred or boundaries or whatever, 
right? So when you are no contact, um, usually there's just no other choice. There's no other viable way that you can survive and have contact. So back to that sort of concept is I never had contact. I, I, I was never ever able to make loving contact. So all that's different today is that now the relationship is in a state of being nonverbal and silent and inactive, whereas before it was active and verbal, but contact was not had in either scenario. And I think that that makes no contact a little more understandable because this is not a hate driven decision. It's a self protection decision. I heard you speak about the idea that the black sheep of the family is the most powerful one, which mm -hmm. seems sort of funny because I would guess that most of them would feel the exact opposite. Yeah. So what is it in your opinion about the black sheep that makes them so powerful and how can they use that power to their benefit? So this is my favorite thing about my new book, um, Adult Survivors of Emotionally Abusive Parents, is I talk all about the scapegoat. The scapegoat is in alignment with the truth, whether they want to be or not. I, I didn't like being in alignment with the truth. After a while, on the Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFJ. I'm a six on the Enneagram. You know, I just, I'm just in alignment with that, whether I like it or not. And I didn't like it forever because anytime I told the truth, I got in trouble. And then this horrible narrative, me, narrative of me started being told. And, and I would start to believe that narrative that I was bad. Like, I remember being like, I'm sorry, I'm so bad. I don't know why I'm so bad, but I'm bad. Like, I'm a horrible person. And my mom would be like, I guess we have to get you therapy. I don't know. Like, really, literally, like you are, you're, you're freaking horrible. Um, you can only take so much of that. I could only take so much. You took 45 years of this right? This is not a, a a decision that was made quickly. It was made consciously. Um, I knew I couldn't mend the fence. So I think that when you're in alignment with the truth, you're, you, you really are the only one who has the potential to heal and break the generational cycle, right? I didn't know all that. I didn't know that till far after no contact. Um, but me being in alignment with the truth made my childhood a living hell, but it has liberated me as an adult because now I do recognize that I was correct about my environment. I was correct about it. Um, and that brings a level of safety for me because now I'm so, so thankful that I got out and leaving a toxic family that is sadistic in nature is like leaving a cult. There's no difference right? Um, and I do feel like no one helps the scapegoat. I write about that. Why doesn't anyone help the scapegoat? I write about that. What happens when the scapegoat starts fighting for him or herself? I write about that. And I talk about um, going from escape, no, scapegoat to escape greatest of all time. It's really cute. <laughs> and it's, it's empowering because if you have the truth, then you are living in your own greatness and you have the ability to do so. I shouldn't be here surviving and thriving the way that I am and to be genuinely happy in my life and to understand the aspects of my personality that are affected by the monsters in my basement, right? And what my personalities had to do to overcome and you know some of the flaws that I have today or fears and anxieties that I have today. I'm so beautifully aware of them that I can nurture love and not self-punish anymore from like a critical parent type of perspective. Um, and I think that had I been in any other role that was less in alignment with right and wrong and morality and, and what's good and what's happy and the fact that my parents were bad people with good moments, they were not good people with bad moments. And that is not my fault. They were abusers before I was born. They remained abusers throughout the raising of me and they continue to abuse, guilt, manipulate and control today. So I'm not the cause and source of the no contact or of them being bad parents. Children don't cause bad parents. Emotionally abusive and manipulative people become 
emotionally abusive and manipulative parents. I had to learn that I had to stop waiting for them to heal for me to heal. And I had to learn and accept, and this was like swallowing sand, but I couldn't heal if they were in my life. And eight years, no contact will be June 12th. And I think that my state of mind and my level of composure and my ability to articulate my pain and help other people and love and love and love and love on my daughter and my stepsons and my man and I have friends and my life is so full and so beautiful. And if I didn't have the truth, I would just be stoned. No one would read my books. I wouldn't be of interest to you. I wouldn't be of interest to Kristen. I wouldn't be of interest, right? And it it's a really liberating full circle moment for me to recognize that I'm doing it. I'm really doing it and I'm happy and I have a hole in my sidewalk and I have to learn to walk down another street so I don't keep falling in that hole. Do I wish that I had an amazing mom like I am to my daughter or my stepsons? Do I wish I had a dad that was cheering me on all the time? Oh my God, yes. And I don't have it. But that is where the healing is because as it hurts, I just never had it, but I'll always grieve it. I have to grieve the living dead and I'm doing it and other people can do it. You said in the podcast that there's no such thing as healed, which mm -hmm. initially seems like it could make people feel really hopeless. So can you speak to why it shouldn't and what you meant by that? So I, I think we all just want to be like, there's an end date to this pain um, because it, it's like losing limbs. You know what I mean? It's like your brain is going to send out a signal to your limbs, like it's time to walk, let's say. But if there's an injury in the spine, the brain doesn't know that the legs aren't working but it, because it can't get past that injury, right? So it's kind of like that. Your heart's so broken that there are so many moments I wish I could just call a mom, call a dad, right? And so the loss is permanent, but it's different than a death because these people are alive and walking around and, and you know that they would rather go to their grave than apologize to their daughter so they could see their daughter and their grandchild ever again. The pride is so massive and so sadistic that they would rather save their ego than, than see their daughter or grandchild again. It's insane. So healing is like a verb, right? And unless you get a lobotomy, you're not gonna forget your childhood in such a way that it doesn't hurt you anymore, or you're not going to be grieving the living dead every day as an adult and have it not affect you. It's just that you're gonna be very aware of it. Wholeness is just simply not a perpetual state of well being. It is understanding that wholeness is all the parts. It's embracing your pain and, and your issues and your flaws as much as it is working on the other things and embracing the free, more happy parts of yourself. Um, I, I sure hope when I die, I still have a lot of psychological inventory in my inbox. Um, this journey is my most passionate pursuit. And I, and I think people can feel like I'm not making progress, I'm failing because they have this idea of being healed when there's no such thing. I love how visceral uh, you are when you speak on this stuff. That's what I noticed in all your interviews. Yes. It, se it, it seems like you're getting legitimately angry when you talk about the injustice <laughs> children yes. go through, which you should, right? Would you say that's accurate? And why do you think people aren't more outraged? Because we, we have this idea that parents are haloed because they birthed a child, especially mothers. And I love, one of the things I get all the time is like, you're so authentic or you're so available, you're so real. Um, I just have nothing to hide. Yes, what's done to me pisses me off. It's not fair, I didn't ask for it, but life isn't fair and I don't look for fairness, but you know, anger, especially in women, 
is very punished. And anger is the most punished emotion in children, which I go over a lot in my new book. Well, why is that? Why is the most misused emotion in parent, parenting anger, but the most punished emotion in a child is anger? Is that not insane? Well, that is because anger brings justice to an injustice and parents aren't angry, they're raging at their kids. Anger and rage are different. They don't want their kids to be angry because they don't want their kids to have justice. If the kids have justice and you're an egotistical parent, uh, then you will see that as a loss of control. Your kids can't be right, right? So I think that there's just a real fallacy and a dreamy belief around parents. In my TED talk, I say, if you Google the word parents, all you see are images of perfect parents and happy homes. That's all you see. So we see this in our movies. We see this in our media. We see this on our Christmas cards. We see it in our cartoons for Christmas and every holidays. Um, and that is the truth for healthy families, but it doesn't speak to the truth of children who don't have that dream. And so we don't want to look at it. I think it's too painful for this society to understand that some of the worst abuses to children are happening from their parents. Yeah, I know we only have a few more minutes, so uh, I'll go through a couple of these questions quickly. You said about your parents, it always felt like effort for them, which I have a feeling there's probably a ton of people out there who feel that way, even if they don't fully realize it. Yeah. If I do recognize it in my own parents, what do I do with that information? Well, it hurts, <laughs> right? Um, I did a show on my own podcast just recently called The Burden Syndrome. And some of the things that feel like lifelong, a lifelong journey for me is this very instinctual habit to not burden anyone with anything. Um, and my partner's really good at helping me with that because I do it instinctively. To, to go back to when I said I turned into vapor, that meant I had to be needless. Okay, I had to be a child without needs. And that's insane, okay? Um, and I feel like being a burden, I was financially abused and manipulated. Um, they hated me but wanted total control over me and divorced me from ever being identified as good. And um, when that's not at your core, it's something you have to really work on for your whole life. And then there's also sort of the not enough syndrome. You're just, I was always too much of something bad and not enough of something good. So it just always felt like they were like, oh, you have to sell Girl Scout cookies Ugh. or, you know, anything. Um, it was done begrudgingly. So if you feel that as a human being and that's coming from your parents, you know, really read books like mine or, or find a therapist who's educated in this way, which there are very few, which is unfortunate. Um, because you have to work through the burden syndrome. You have to work through um, not feeling enough or wondering if someone's going to be mad at you all the time, not knowing, not being able to feel safe in any relationships, constantly waiting for the bottom to fall out, not knowing what loyalty is and, and if someone's loyal, right? Um, if that resonates with you, then then it really is an extreme form of abandonment that you're going through. Um, they might be alive walking around in your life. You might see and talk to them every day, but if they're mean to you and they're making you feel like effort and a drag and you want too much um, and you're not doing enough, you're not caretaking enough for them, um, then, then yeah, it's a very rejecting, abandoning feeling and you would really need to kind of dive into those wounds and um, understand them so you can liberate yourself, you know, in, in the awareness of them so you can navigate them better. So who should pick up your books and how's it going to help them? Um, I just think that anyone who is on the spectrum of feeling like they don't know what to do in their family, 
I've kind of become the no contact queen. I'm also the only expert who really writes about it and also who tells her story. Um, I'm not just telling stories of my patients or other people. And I think that that has made me kind of get to this space where people feel like they're getting a hug on every page because they're, they're talking to another survivor, right? So if you have questions about it, my books aren't just about no contact. Um, there are all kinds of options, but it will really help you break down if you're on that precipice of should I or shouldn't I, or if I do what level, right? Because different levels of abuse, I think, can be married up with different forms and levels of contact. And between my book, But It's Your Family and Adult Survivors of Toxic Family Members and now the one on Emotionally Abusive Parents, I cover all of it. Are you abandoning your parents if you go no contact, right? Are you the bad guy? Those are all the questions I ask. What do you do when they die? Um, and I really go into Eric Erickson's life stage development on why you have these wounds at these ages and you know why midlife is often when people cut off. Um, but I don't think that anyone or everyone has to cut off. I think that you can navigate these relationships and my books are a, a complete step-by-step -step process on how to do any and all of it. So it just will help you to get out of confusion. The worst thing about abuse is the confusion it creates. And that's why the intermittent doses of kindness are so effective because if you're too confused, to make a decision, then you won't go. You won't make one. And it erodes your resiliency and your confidence over time, which makes you less and less likely to save your life. So I think that my books are just a wonderful, gentle, practical, safe roadmap to really helping yourself. And my podcast goes through all of this stuff as well. And as the feedback on my podcast is just beyond my greatest dreams. So um, I love that people feel like they're nearly getting therapy out of a podcast, even though it's not designed for that. But it is true that there are very few psychologists that are open to showing their clients that they're also, also a survivor. I'm in therapy. I'll always be in therapy. I wouldn't want to see a therapist who didn't see a therapist. You know what I mean? We should all be here healing. I'm not a guru. I'm not a god, I'm just a survivor. And I wouldn't follow a leader who hadn't suffered. Because I believe that if pain came to that leader and they'd never suffered, I don't know that they would know how to get the troop through the pain, right? And I've suffered and I still suffer. And um, I write about it. And it's helpful to other people like me. And there's lots of us. We spoke a little bit in the DMs about Alice Miller, who sort of pioneered this idea of you don't have to love your parents. Yes. I see, I see in my comments every day how far we still are from accepting that belief as a society. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people who think you owe your parents gratitude for giving you life and, you know, keeping you clothed and fed? Well, they chose to have children. That's a basic obligation <laughs> to meet their basic needs. Again, children aren't things they're not a property that you own the title to um they are not here designed to be your emotional slave or your emotional trash can or your emotional janitor um parents need to be adults not adult children raising children right toxic adult children my mom is a 14 year old mean girl um my dad a bully it's just a bully and a coward and cruel. And so I had two toxic adult children raising me and they weren't not committed to me. They, they didn't treat me well. They weren't committed to me. They did what they did for me because they had to and they made me very clear about that. And that wouldn't be lovable to anybody that wasn't family. And it's strange to me that people can be abusers. Families are made up of people, but somehow you slap a title on that group and you call it family. And now somehow they're not abusers anymore. That just doesn't make any sense with deductive reasoning, 
right? Um, abuse in the family is real. It happens all the time. And it's just now starting to get attention. I think it's just too painful for people to understand that some of the most ridiculous abuses are happening behind closed doors. I watched at least four law and crime cases. The boy in the box, uh, his parents made a box for him to live in in Florida with no uh, air conditioning and whatnot. He only got five years in prison for sadistic abuse. I watched Lori Vallow's children get murdered and her other children testify against her. I watched Letitia Stouck's daughter testify against her mother for killing her stepson. And, and yet somehow I just watched a dad abuse the hell out of his kid on a treadmill. This case uh, finished last week and the sentencing hasn't happened, but he was found guilty. Poor little boy had a lacerated heart. Um, and somehow these cases just don't get added to the literature. It's almost like, well, those are extreme cases, right? Those parents didn't deserve to have children. So they have to be murdered? What about emotional homicide? What about emotional rape of children? Why isn't that important? Because it can't be proven in the court of law? That doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. And no one should be living under those conditions. If I was in love with a man that was abusing me, everyone would want me to get out. If I had a friendship, a boss or a coworker abusing me the way that my parents did, everyone would want me to get out, but just not when it's my parents, right? That doesn't make sense. So I just think that part of my purpose in this world is to kind of disrupt that narrative and whatever small mark I make in this world, if it's helping even just one person that's enough for me because I think that these things are injustices socially that they do need to change so that we can heal. I mean, we have such a violent culture right now, um, but we don't want to look at parents as contributing. That It just doesn't make sense. If you hate your kids and your kids learn to hate themselves and they don't heal, what, what's the outcome? How, how are we going to get better? Right, so I, I love the idea of cycle breakers. You know, Nelson Mandela said that, you know, at the very soul of a society is a child. So our future is in our children and how we love or don't love them. So to heal a society's soul, we have to be healing at the core. And I think there's a lot of cycle breakers out there right now. And I'm so happy to be a part of that movement. And I can't believe I even got on the TEDx stage um, that is one competitive stage, but I'm so thankful that the message is out there and um, it's being very well received right now. The numbers are fantastic and um, I'm just happy to be a voice in this community among many others that have amazing voices. The people that you highlight on your page are incredible leaders as well. Thank you so much. That yeah. That's a, a beautiful way to summarize it. And I want to say personally, thank you so much for your work. I oh. love the fact that this space is growing with people who are taking the responsibility off children and putting it back onto parents where it belongs and telling you that if you don't feel they did a good job, that's your right and it's valid. That's and so right. thank you for being that voice. Thank you so much for having me. And I just, from my heart, just so appreciate that you've seen my work and that you're you're invested in it and it means something to you and you promote it. I just, I hope you can feel how thankful I am for you. And um, it's been really special having you show up in my world. And uh, I'm, I feel so honored to be amongst the, the, the people that you choose. So just thank you. <laughs>